This is a global positioning chip that communicates with satellites in space to locate its position here on Earth. In your smartphones, this is what tells you where you are, maybe where you're going, or if you're like me, where to find a good cup of coffee. But this same technology, when coupled with a battery and hung around the neck of a large mammal like this mule deer, is revolutionizing how we understand wildlife migrations. So as this deer goes bounding off with its new collar, that collar will locate it every hour for two to three years. I'm a wildlife researcher at the University of Wyoming and the US Geological Survey. And when I started working in Wyoming, migration was not the focus of my research. But every time we get the data back from one of these collars, the movements, the journeys these animals make amaze us. And you can't help but wonder why these animals go where they go. So in 2007, we collared elk within about 20 miles of the Buffalo Bill Center where we are tonight. And that was a study to look at how elk interacted with wolves. But what we learned was that in the spring, those elk climbed the Absorca Mountains up into Yellowstone National Park some 40 to 50 year, uh, miles away. To study a population decline, we collared moose with their big bodies and long legs. And in that study, we learned that those moose, who were collared just east of Jackson Lake in the Buffalo Valley, in spring migrated north through the Teton Wilderness, also up to summer range inside of Yellowstone National Park. And it was collaring and capturing efforts like these that, in this case, collaring pronghorn on their summer ranges near Grand Teton National Park that led to the discovery of what is now known as the path of the pronghorn, a 120-mile migration. That migration takes pronghorn up the headwaters of the Green River and between the Wind River Range and the Grovant Mountains and then down into Grand Teton National Park. Much of our work has focused on mule deer, which is an iconic species which is in decline across the West. This is a young doe, and she's wearing a special collar. Her collar sends her data to the web every three days. We don't typically name our study animals, but in this case, since we're going to be keeping close tabs on her movements, we named her Jet, and there'll be more on her story later. Mule deer are the long distance migrants of the West, and their movements have taught us more about Wyoming's migrations than any other species. So when we collared mule deer in the upper Green River Basin near Pinedale, we found those animals in spring migrate into three different summer mountain ranges for summer. And when we collared mule deer in the southern foothills of the Wyoming Range, we found that those animals in spring migrate up the spine of the Wyoming Range into its high mountain valleys for summer. As you can see from this map, Wyoming is a landscape of mountains and plains. And most of our migratory herds winter in the plains or basins, and summer in the mountains. And this is just a sampling of the migration routes that have been documented in Wyoming. So why do these animals migrate? Well, large mammals in the Rockies with, its, with our harsh seasonal environment are faced with a problem. The mountains provide abundant for, forage in the spring and summer, but they're lousy year-round habitat. And that's because these animals can't withstand the chest-deep snow that accumulates there in the winter. The plains or basins are much more mild in the winter, but they too are lousy year-round habitat. And that's because they're dry and unproductive, and they provide very little food in the spring and summer. Migration then is a solution to this problem. It allows animals to exploit the abundant forage in the mountains in spring and summer, and then enjoy the milder conditions in the plains in winter. But now that we have this GPS technology, we can look at the entire migration route. And what we're learning is that the migration route is not just a connector between winter range and summer range. And the timing of how animals move along that route is critically important. And that's because of how plants grow. When plants are young and just emerging, they're low in fiber. Now, unlike us, Large mammals aren't dieting. 
So they need diets that are low in fiber to allow them to put on fat during spring and summer. And that's the energy stores that will get them through the lean winters. And so they do this by seeking out plants that are young when they're just greening up. So I want to show you an animation of how mule deer track the spring green up. To orient you, this is the Wyoming Range running north-south, the winds to the east, and the Green River Basin in the middle. What you're going to see are the spring migrations of six mule deer, three that winter to the southern uh, foothills of the Wyoming Range, and three that winters to the east. And then the background is greenness, as seen from space. And it, too, will change as these animals migrate. So, when, so the migration starts when the Green River Basin is just starting to green up. Those big dots are each day's specific locations. Notice that these deer don't just run all the way up to summer range. <laughs> Although they could, they're deer. They could do this in two days if they wanted to. OK, so now I've paused it in the middle of the migration. Spring ha has come, and it's just starting to creep up the mountains. And notice that the deer are stopped over right at the leading edge of spring, where they can access that fresh green growth, where they can get the best nutrition. We found that they stop over for days, even weeks at a time during their migrations, and then eventually follow spring up to their high mountain summer ranges. So this research has shown us that in a two to three month migration, these animals are stopped over feeding 95% of the time. And they're stopped over in foraging patches that are just starting to green up. And this is the key to allowing them to put on fat in spring and summer. We refer to this as surfing the green wave. <laughs> and it's changed how we think of migration. It tells us that we need to think about the migration route itself as habitat. And that these animals need to time their movements along that route to get the best food. So migration is the solution to living on a landscape of mountains and plains. And it's been learned over generations. In fact, archaeological data suggests that many of these migrations have been around for thousands of years. So think about that. These animals are using migration routes that they've been using since before Wyoming was settled. So here's a different map. This is the map of the trapper Osborne Russell who moved around northwest Wyoming in the 1830s. As he moved through this landscape in 1837, he would, have, he would have been trapping beaver and killing bison for meat. And he would have encountered some of these same migrations of mule deer, pronghorn, moose, and elk that our research has rediscovered over 170 years later. Of Jackson's Hole, Russell said, this valley, like all this country, abounds with game. And we now know that the ability to migrate was key to that abundance. And it's key to the abundance we have today. But as our group has mapped out these migrations and started to place them on today's landscape, you quickly see that some of these migration routes are changing. So for example, our sagebrush basins are being altered by energy development. And so we became curious how are these animals responding to this type of change? And here's what some of that change looks like. This is the Jonah field in the Green River Basin. It's one of the most productive natural gas fields in the lower 48. This is what it looked like in 1990. And this is what it looked like in 2002, 12 years later. So each of those squares is a well pad. And we know that development like this can fragment land landscapes, but it also brings vehicles, traffic, and human activity. I became interested in this in looking at the path of one animal, a pronghorn antelope. So this animal winters in the south of the Green River Basin and then migrates north through open sagebrush country. And what caught my eye is this pronounced jog in the middle of an otherwise straight route. From this view, that jog is a bit of a mystery. But when you zoom in, you see that that animal bumps into the Jonah, the Jonah field and then detours around it before resuming its path to its summer range. So this one animal made me wonder, how often are our migrating big game running into development and disturbance and having to alter the way they move through their migrations? Our research has shown that mule deer also detour around development. And they do something else. They speed up. So unlike deer moving through intact habitat, 
as you're seeing here, deer moving through development nearly double their movement rate. We also have found that animals that are speed up stop over less to feed and most likely do a poor job of surfing the green wave. Wyoming is also growing and we know that residential development is typically permanent and this too can block migration routes. So here's an example of what some of that looks like. Uh, this is another pronghorn migration route. These animals winter on rolling sagebrush hills to the south and then migrate just past the town of Pinedale and then up to their summer ranges some 50 miles to the north. This is what that landscape looked like in 1954. And this is what it looks like today. Today, as pronghorn migrate through this northern portion of the route, they have to contend with a fairly large residential development. And this happens because for the most part, we don't have these migration routes mapped, and we certainly didn't in 1954. But we also don't include them in how we develop rural areas. So several years ago, I began trying to connect the dots between what our research was showing about the ecology of migration and its importance to these animals, and what we were learning about how migrating animals respond to Wyoming's changing landscapes. I was particularly interested in trying to figure out what it means for the long-term persistence of these routes. And the picture that's starting to emerge is a bit sobering. So we now know when faced with this type of development, these animals will speed up, detour, and feed, over, feed less on the fresh green grass. In time, in the long run, that will lead to the loss of the foraging benefit of migration, and then the loss of the individuals who have memory of those routes, and ultimately to the loss of the migration routes themselves. So I'm using our research, research to infer what might be a likely outcome for Wyoming and the West over the long run. But in fact, this has already happened all over the world. Scores of migration routes from wildebeest in Namibia to gazelle on the Mongolian grasslands to bighorn sheep or elk here in the Mountain West have already been lost. And how would we know if a migration route was lost? Well, here's that same pronghorn that detoured around the Jonah field. These data were taken a decade ago. And since then, the Jonah field has continued to expand and intensify. I can't tell you today if this migration is still occurring. And that's because we don't monitor these migrations. If a migration was lost, it probably wouldn't even be documented. So it was with these ideas in mind that we started the Wyoming Migration Initiative several years ago. Us and other researchers were collecting all this detailed data on these migrations, but it wasn't being collated, standardized, or synthesized. It wasn't even all in the same place. And so our big idea was to make better, more detailed maps of these migration routes and to get those maps in the hands of wildlife managers and conservation groups that are doing the planning and conservation work on the ground. And then this happened. My colleague Paul Sawyer put some collars on some mule deer that he thought were resident that lived year round in the Red Desert just north of Rock Springs. When he got those collars back in the spring, he discovered that those animals migrate north through the desert and then another 100 miles along the foothills of the winds to their summer ranges up in the Hoback River Basin. To the best of our knowledge, this is the world's longest mule deer migration, 150 miles and we didn't even know it existed until 2012. Here's that same migration route overlaid on a land ownership map. Through the course of a typical one seasonal migration, these animals cross three to four different highways, over 100 fences. They cross lands managed by two federal agencies, two state agencies, and they cross in and out of private lands 41 times. The development on, these, on this landscape is uncertain. Because to date, none of the agencies that manage these lands have the regulatory means to incorporate migration routes like these into the, their land use planning. So it was because of this complexity that in this case, we decided to try something different. We worked with cartographers at the University of Oregon to produce maps that the public could easily interpret. Our goal was just to help people understand where this migration route occurred on the landscape. The route's also a bit of an obstacle course, and so we identified the top 10 obstacles 
and put them on the map. And much to our surprise, wildlife managers and conservation groups have jumped at the opportunity to start working on these obstacles. In January of this year, five agencies and nine conservation groups got together to, to evaluate the route. For two days, they poured over maps, methodically moving from the winter range 150 miles up to the Hoback. They were looking for conservation solutions and ways in which they could work together to sustain this migration. So this has been really exciting for us to watch. These groups are putting this migration route on the map, actually on many different maps, and into the planning process. So I want to return to JET. JET is one of those Red Desert to Hoback migrations. Here she is uh, being, re being released onto her desert winter range about a month ago. Before this talk, I checked in on JET. I downloaded her most recent satellite transmission, and I put them on this map. Can you see them? You might not be able to, because she's still in the Red Desert. She hasn't migrated yet, although many of, of her herd have. But she will migrate, maybe in another week or two. And when she does, this is the route she will take. It's the route she took last year. It's the only route she knows. It's the route she'll use for the rest of her life. At Capture, we learned that she's carrying twins. When she gets up to summer range, she'll give birth to those twins. And if those fawns survive the summer and the fall and migrate with her back to the Red Desert, they too will continue this 150-mile tradition. It's my hope that Jet and her descendants can continue this journey for a very long time. And for us, getting migration routes like these on the map has been a first step in facilitating their conservation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.